This is Jerry Fry, audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. The following is the professional history of a PPB member told by himself in his own fashion on February 5th of 2009. These interviews are being audio taped in order to compile firsthand a living history of the members of our organization and the stories of their professional experiences. Many of our members began in what is called the golden age of radio and television, and this is an attempt to preserve as much data as possible for succeeding generations. This recording is not intended for broadcast without first obtaining permission from Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. With me today on the telephone from Studio City, California, is Gene Webster. Uh, Gene is the current board member of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters, and if I remember correctly, Gene, you were also a charter member of PPB, were you not? That's right. That's right. I was one of the uh, first members. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm not even sure how long ago that was. Well, that must have been 1966, 43 years ago, when yeah. when the organization uh, began. Uh, Fantastic. Well, you are one of the few remaining, I guess, and uh, that's wonderful to have you. But let's start from the very beginning and tell us a little bit about where you were born, when you were born, and a bit about your childhood growing up. Well, I was born in a little pinpoint of a town in the middle of uh, Nebraska called Shelton. Uh, I don't know just how big it is, was Danny, but uh, my dad was uh, the banker in uh, the small town, some banker, I guess they were, I'm not sure, there may have been, he may have had an assistant. I don't remember whether it was a man or a woman. And uh, all that came to a crashing uh, halt with the uh, big crash in, uh, was it November of 28? Something like that, I believe, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I would have been about three years old mm -hmm. when that happened. And... Uh, we, uh, my, my dad, like so many people in, in those days, was suddenly out of a job, and uh, he Is... began to look desperately for something to do, and he wound up, uh, he had a friend that had gone to Washington State, uh -huh. to the Tacoma area, and mm -hmm. so my dad came out here, uh, out to the West Coast. West Coast. And... Uh, we moved out a, a year later, or several months later, anyhow. Uh -huh. And I really grew up in uh, in Tacoma, Washington. Well, very good. I'm I'm a sort of a neighbor of yours. I grew up in Spokane. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you were you were in a, a rather drier part of the state. Yeah, on the other side of the Cascades. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. So you were about what uh, four years old then when you moved? Yes. Uh huh. Yes, uh, four or five. I'm. Uh, that's all kind of hazy. I'm not uh, not too uh, sharp on it. I understand. Yeah. yeah. You so my you... first interest in radio came with uh, I had an older brother who was nine years older than I was. His, <laughs> his name was Maury Webster. Maury. Maury. Uh huh. A U R I E. Okay. He went on to, uh, well, he was, uh, got a job uh, in Tacoma, and I think he was probably the youngest announcer on the Pacific Coast in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a friend that was also in radio uh, in that area. I think he was in Seattle, though. That was Art Gilmore. Oh, yes. Art is... And when uh, I think he and Maury came to Southern California together, and Art <clears throat> got a job, and Maury came back up there, but he was only 16 or 17. But wow. the first interest in radio, as I started to say, was hmm. uh, Maury built, was, built a crystal set. And I can remember with that little wire that they called the cat's whisker, I do recall and that. Walk around on that little crystal to see what we could pick up in the way of radio, <laughs> and I'd always been fascinated by it since then. 
And you had to listen with headphones, of course. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, and uh, I went to uh, elementary school in Tacoma, Bryant High School, uh, Bryant Elementary School, and Jason Lee Intermediate School, and went on to Stadium High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you in, did you do anything in high school in the way of dramatics or speech? Oh yes, yeah, I was I was. Uh, involved in oh I did some I don't know I guess they were kind of one man shows uh -huh. and uh, it was the, the uh, school auditorium as, in the school auditorium was the school orchestra and stuff one of the uh, one of my uh Classmates, well, actually, she was uh, about a year ahead of me. Was a very pretty girl named Donna May Jaden, and uh, she uh, later came to Southern California. She was the lead in all the all the high school productions, uh -huh. and uh, she, after graduating, she came to Southern California, and. She changed her name to Janet Janice Page. Oh, for heaven's sake! She went on to do a lot of good movies and and stage productions too, I believe. Yeah, yeah. She uh, Pajama Game, I think she did on Broadway. On Broadway, I'm yes. not sure of that. Yes, yeah, she did with John uh, Reed. She was. Uh, we went to the same junior high school, the <clears> same <throat> high school and attended the same church, the First Baptist Church, in uh, 9th and Market Streets in Tacoma. Uh -huh. And uh, when I was, uh, I guess, a senior in high school, the school had a uh, program that was on KMO Radio mm -hmm. in Tacoma. Jerry Gian, I think, was the general manager. And... Uh, Every, uh, I think we, with the other high schools in town, there were one or two others, and uh, I was the host when uh, the Stadium High School was involved. Uh, and now, when you were in in school, uh, you, what what did your father end up doing when he moved to Tacoma? Uh, <laughs> this was the. the Height of the Depression. Yeah, sure. And my father wound up trying to sell insurance, which was a kind of a hopeless case. It was a pretty, some very rough time. Oh, indeed. Very rough time. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> my my brother had gone on to become a, an announcer for the uh, the CBS affiliate there, KBI. <clears throat> as, as a teenager, you mentioned. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think she was 17. Yeah, boy, that's terrific. started announcing. That. What about your mother? Was she involved in any form of show business? Was he? No, your mother. Oh, no. Uh, well, my mother was, uh, rather, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it, rather straight-laced type. She was head of the, uh, president of the Women's Society for the local Baptist church up there. Oh, yes, okay. And uh, is that enough said? Mm-hmm, I understand. <laughs> uh, I understand. Yeah, she, uh, she made certain that there was never any, never any liquor in the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my brother announced he was interested in becoming a preacher. Oh. And that immediately won her favor. Oh, I suspect, yes. Uh, but he, uh, after he got into radio, he, he changed uh, all together. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, uh... Well, while you were growing up in Tacoma, a very famous event happened up there, something about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Has absolutely, it did happen, and it was a big day for me because we had that day, we had a football game with Lincoln High School, the, the rival high school in Tacoma. Uh -huh. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the second or third string center on uh, our uh, the B team, I guess you would call it. Uh huh. And uh, we had the football game that day, and the guy that was the regular center went out to see the the crash on the bridge. And so I actually got to play. <laughs> wow. For those that don't remember and who are listening to this recording, uh, the f suspension bridge in the Narrows of Tacoma uh, started twisting and turning in the wind and actually collapsed, totally uh, ruining the bridge. Yes, the, uh, some very famous pictures were shot of the car that was on the bridge. Do you remember that? I do indeed, yes. Everybody got off safely, but the car as I recall, did not survive. The car did not survive, nor did the dog that was in the car. And the car belonged to one of the father of <laughs> one of my schoolmates, and it was oh. her dog. Oh my went goodness! Down. I didn't know. But I didn't know about the and dog. I can remember walking across that bridge, and it, as it, uh, even on a rather calm day, would twist and turn in the. There's a shaft of wind that came through that narrows, mm -hmm. and uh, the real shocking thing about that was that the guy that was supposed to insure it had not done so. Uh huh. Wow. And there is a, a a lot of uh, questions about what happened uh, at the time. Sure. Sure. Well, that was quite a, an experience for anyone living in that area, but I certainly recall seeing the newsreel footage of it and hearing the radio broadcasts of that event yeah. in Spokane. Now, how did you get in, in, interested in broadcasting? How did I? Well, I was always interested in, in because of broadcasting. Your bro I, I love the sound of words, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I... Uh, after high school, and uh, December 7th, I was still a senior in high school, and I remember very well the day that so many of uh, my Japanese friends suddenly didn't show up for school. Oh. And they'd been rounded up and taken off to the camps. Uh-huh. Uh, I went on to, uh, I graduated from high school in June of 1942, and uh, entered the University of Washington in Seattle uh, with a, to take a journalism course, and I was just there a few months when uh, there was a sudden order from Washington, uh, from the Capitol, from the president's office, FDR. Mm -hmm. uh, closing all of the enlistments in the school programs, the college programs. And I was one of them that uh, had to have some dental work done in order to uh, qualify. And I planned to have that done in December of, uh, of the year after I graduated mm -hmm. uh, from high school. And... Uh, I suddenly uh, faced the prospect of uh, get it, being drafted, and I had a, I'd already had some friends who had gone off and had been killed. So I, uh, Jerry, I feel like I'm taking much too long with this. No, you're I doing be fine. Moving along faster. Yeah, you know, you're doing fine. But your friends, of course, being killed would. Uh, well, make... that it, it 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 scared me. Yeah, it would make and you very apprehensive. I, uh, there was suddenly an opportunity. There was a little item, not a front page item, but a little back in the probably in the Tacoma News Tribune, uh, that the Navy had signed a contract with uh, Pan American Airways on Boeing Field in Seattle mm -hmm. uh, to fly supplies to the Alaskan bases, the Alaskan Navy bases, uh, because the Navy did not have uh, a 
flying. Uh, did not have the equipment, and so they signed the contract with Pan Am. And uh, if you were accepted by Pan Am, you would automatically become uh, a member of the Navy. Oh. And I qualified for that, and that's how I got into the Navy. You, so you came and into the Navy? the fact that they had closed enlistments in the college program. Uh-huh. Uh, so you'd had, you'd had no college at that point, or you'd had some? Oh, no, I'd had some. some. I had, had some. As a matter of fact, uh, I had uh, was working for the, uh, going to school and working for the Seattle Park Department, uh-huh. writing uh, promotional copy and uh, news stories. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, when the, the Navy, I was in the Navy for three and a half years. Okay, and where did they send you? Well, I uh, I was stationed there at Boeing Field. Mm-hmm. And, uh, as I say, we were supply, flying supplies to the uh, Alaska bases. Mm-hmm. And from there, they sent me to uh, Alameda Naval Air Base. Okay. And we continued to fly supplies. I was a, a lowly a, a aviation machine in Spain. Okay. And I think of the fact that I was working on the planes. I was an engine mechanic. And I do understand that we won that war, although with me as an engine mechanic, it's baffling to me how we did it. Yeah. How did you learn to be a, an engine mechanic? Navy taught you how? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had had no background. It was completely foreign to anything I had ever done. Wow. My first job, uh, before I before I went with Pan Am, I worked in a furnace. Uh, I don't mean furnace. I mean a foundry. Uh-huh. I worked in a foundry, and we were making strap hangers for the victory ships. I see. Which were being assembled in Tacoma. My job was to heat the steel <clears throat> in a blast furnace, and when it got to the proper temperature to be malleable, and mm. I had to learn to judge that by the color of the steel. Oh. I had to wrestle the steel out and get it to a blacksmith mm. who would uh, shape the strap hangers. Wow. The strap hangers with the pipe hangers, I mean, that. Uh, you remember those World War II victory ships that they, along the ceilings of the ship, the overhead, mm-hmm. uh, that you would see the pipes that, for various electronic lines and ducts and so on. Uh huh. That was that was before. That was before. Uh, I uh, I spent the the bulk of the time. The uh, repair shop was on Treasure Island, out in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, that we got that place got cold. Man, we were pretty windy there, huh? <laughs> oh, cold and windy, and yeah. I can remember what it was like to stand watches out there in oh, the wow. middle of the night and <laughs> think I was never going to be warm again. Sunny California. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Anyhow, that uh, I was finally transferred back up to Sand Point, uh-huh. uh, a, a Navy base near Seattle. Yes. And uh, I was just waiting to be mustered out. And one day a young officer came to the area where I was working and said, uh, I'm looking for a... Gene C. Webster, AMM2C, is is he here? And by that time, I'd been around long enough to be a little careful about what I admitted to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, he's not here right now. What did you want him for? And the guy kind of broke down, and he said, well, I'm I'm with the, uh, what do they call it, the... uh, information office here and I have to find a replacement before I can uh, get discharged 
And he said, I've looked through all the papers, and this Webster is the only one who has any background at all. And so he said, I would like him to come over and uh, replace me so I can get out. <laughs> you were his ticket to freedom, huh? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I uh, finally admitted that it was that I was the one he was looking for. And I remember I, I shared an office with a Lieutenant Commander Heffelfinger. Believe it or not, there is, I actually knew somebody named Heffelfinger. Boy, that's a that's something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got out got out of the. Uh, I was eventually discharged, also. But you did you work and, did you work in uh, the information office before you were discharged? I beg your pardon? Did you work in the information office before you yes. were discharged? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Public information office. Yes. Well, now you did that sort of thing too, didn't you, Jerry? Yeah, but I was in the Army in Germany. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah I know. I remember we talked about an instance, <clears throat> uh, some uh, experience I had in uh, Tokyo. Yes. Uh -huh. Year, many years later. Indeed. Uh, so but I, I, when I got out of the Navy, finally, my... That was in what year would that have been, Gene? Uh, you know, I was trying to think of that. I think it was probably 55. 55 or 60. I was in for three and a half years. Oh, so you went in the Navy after the war? No, 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 no. I, yeah. got, I was in there during the war. You well, that's what I thought. So yeah, we were flying the supplies to those. Yeah. So maybe it was for hobbies and, uh, and so, so the guys who were down there doing the fighting. So was it 1945 that you may have been? Yeah. Distant? What did I say? You said 55. Oh no, 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 no! It was 45. 45. Okay. Now 45, we're 46. Now we're under. and uh, when I got out, I came down here to Southern California because my parents had moved down here and. Uh, my sister had come down here, and she married a, a guy named Tommy Tomlinson, Everett F. Tomlinson, who was head of the writing department at CBS Radio hmm. down here. What brought your parents to Southern California? Uh, they, well, my my father was, uh, oh, he was in his 70s by then, at least. He would uh, long since retired. Hmm. And uh, I thought I was going to come down here and be the world's greatest announcer, but I got here and found that Art Gilmore already had that job. Yeah, that's right. And your brother was still working as an announcer? Uh, well, he had, during the during the height of uh, World War II, he had headed up a uh, Navy communication school at Harvard. Oh, at Harvard, uh-huh. And uh, I... I Finally wound up as an usher here, and you mentioned the golden days of radio. That was truly the golden days. Sure was. That would be uh, an usher at CBS uh, Columbia Square. Columbia Square, sixty-one twenty-one Sunset Boulevard. Boy, uh, I had a couple of interesting experiences during the, those days. I remember that I was told to go into <coughs> the big studio where. There was a, the Durante Moore show was uh, Gary, uh, Gary Moore and Randy Jimmy Durante. Gary Moore. Yeah. Uh, they were rehearsing for the broadcast that was coming up later. Mm hmm And uh, I was told to go down and rope off a row of seats for the one of the sponsors. And I hesitated and I said, go on, I could go down there and rope them off. And I walked into the studio with the rope and I very quietly tried to make no noise. Went down and started to rope off the seats of the, as I'd been told to do. And the cast was rehearsing at a microphone in the center of the stage. Mm -hmm. And there was Jimmy Durante. And I looked up and he he saw me and he stopped the rehearsal and he came over and he walked down the steps and I thought, oh my God, I'm toast. I'm out of here. <laughs> and he came over and he put 
put his hand out and he said, Hello there, I'm Jimmy Durante. I don't think I've seen you here before. Uh, this is my program and so on. And what a what a wonderful gentleman. I, I, mm. I couldn't believe there were people like that in the business. That would be really outstanding. Yes. And one other experience I had as an usher. This was one of the really thrilling moments. I was told uh, to go over to Studio B or C, Studio B, I believe it was, which was an audience studio. Uh, uh -huh. Later, where Steve Allen started doing his nighttime stuff, was in the, with a, an audience, was in that big studio. Mm -hmm. And my job was to secure the uh, studio and make sure that nobody came in. And I said, what's, what's this all about? And I said, just go do it. And I went over and the, there was a table set up in the middle of the stage. There was one chair at the table and nobody on the, on the set, nobody on the, on the stage. The control room was behind glass windows off to the right. And I thought, what, what is this all about? And finally, Agnes Moorhead came out. And she was there to do the first radio version of Sorry Wrong Number. Oh, a real classic. Oh, what a <laughs> classic. And I, I was easy to see got into it. Sure. Why there was to be nobody in that studio because she literally... Jerry, she literally tore herself apart. Hmm. I had the... I, I, I still choke up at the, at the thought of that. I had that magnificent actress. Wow. And I thought, my God, what an honor this is. And you were there. And this was back in the days, you probably will remember, when because of the time differential people between the East and the West Coast. Mm -hmm. They had to do two versions of each program. Absolutely, yes. And I remember listening to that broadcast and being scared out of my wits. Was yeah. It? Oh, wow. Oh, she was, ah, what a thrill that was. Wow. And uh, anyhow, from uh, being a lecturer, I went on to do various things, hustling prizes for giveaway shows. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, and there were a lot of giveaway shows in those days. Oh, yes. Yep. Oh, yes. Do you remember the names? Of, <laughs> do you remember the names? Of all of the old dames' gift packages. God, we had hundreds of those. I think that we'd, we'd give away uh, uh, really something. And you know, the, the back in those days, the prizes were, were minimal, really. Uh, anyhow, I went on to from. Uh, I went on from the, just doing that to they. I finally they let me write promotional copy for the air, and I did that. And eventually, I got became a, a staff writer and director for CBS Radio. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was trying to figure it out. I have been a member of the Writers Guild of America for well over 60 years. Oh my goodness. You were, and also, I was a member of the Directors Guild. Originally, it was the RDG, the Radio Directors Guild. Mm -hmm. And then television came along, and it became the RTDG, Radio and Television Directors Guild. And... Uh, I've also been a member of, the, of that for over 60 years. And... Uh, so you moved you moved up from being an usher to right into the, into the writing area? Of no, uh, no, I did uh, that business of hustling prizes. Oh, prizes, of course, yes. And... Uh, now, when you say... Uh, uh, anything I could do to you of to get into the business. We had a seam 
CBS was so wise, they had the, what they called the, the Columbia Radio Players. Mm-hmm. And this was a young group, group of wannabes. And uh, they let us use the studios when they weren't uh, used for on-air products, uh, right. programs. They let us use the studios to uh, to practice, and we had our own uh, our own group of guys. And I remember a couple of them were well. They were we looked up to them because they were they were really something. Uh, a guy named uh, Norman McDonald and, oh, what was the other? Johnny Dunkel, I think. Mm-hmm. And they they were the guys who came up with an idea that they called Gunsmoke. <laughs> and uh, those, were, those were very exciting days. Yeah, oh, I can well imagine. But yes, you know, I uh, I think I may have the name. Uh, Norm McDonald was the guy, but I, are, don't, I don't. Johnny something, and I can't no, I, I remember the name Norm McDonald. That, that sticks yeah. in my memory. Uh, wh- when you mentioned hustling prizes for the quiz shows, what do you mean by that? Did you have to go out and, and find uh, people? I'd have to. I'd have to call people, look through magazines for ads. Mm-hmm. I call people and tell them that uh, you know, in exchange for a prize to give away on the radio, they would get radio mention and title uh, identification and so on. I see. So you were an early uh, Art Alisi type person. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't remember that name. No. Uh, yeah, but there were there was there that was quite a quite a business. Yeah, but what were some of the shows that you you obtained prizes for? Do you remember their names? No, because they were, as you mentioned, there were so many. Oh, I think Meet the Misses was one. Oh yes, uh huh. A very popular five day a week program. I think that later uh, Art mm-hmm. Linklater came in, and uh, the House Art Linklater show replaced the uh, uh, Meet the Misses. Uh, Art Linkletter's house party. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you working there, you must have run into a, a number of famous people during that career. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, I, uh, in, in those early days before I got into writing and so on, uh, I well, I guess it was while I was still writing promotional copy, I. Uh, <clears throat> had a desk in a rather cavernous room that there were four or five other desks in there. And one of them was occupied by a guy that did a late night radio show that he called Breaking All Records. And if he'd play a record and if he didn't like it, he'd smash it on the air. (laughs) That was Steve Allen. Steve Allen, oh, I remember reading about that. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Before he, uh, before he started having guests, one night he had the, had a guest in. I think the first one. I don't remember who that was, but I went to him the next day and I said, "Steve, I have just, my, I, I was a jazz buff. I've been a jazz buff all my life. As a matter of fact, I wrote a in high school. I wrote a." column for the high school paper on a jazz yes yeah oh and uh, i had just met charlie barnett oh man uh, for those who don't remember that was one of the big bands of the swing era sure and i i said i, I met this guy and he's got some wonderful stories charlie barnett and steve says well, what will I talk to him about? And I said, well, talk to him about jazz. And he said, well, I, I don't know much about that. And I said, I'll give you the questions. And I will, uh, I really think I introduced Steve to jazz. For heaven's sake. And, and Steve was a musician himself. Oh, he was a, one of the most talented people I have ever known. Mm-hmm. He, he used to do a thing where he would ask people for a phone number when he started having the audiences in. He'd ask him for a phone number and he'd pick out the 
by the numbers on the keyboard, mm -hmm. and he would instantaneously compose a little melody from their phone number. Oh, well, my. And he, he, was, he, he was an incredibly gifted man. Yes, he as was. As what became obvious. Very quick-witted indeed. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes, yeah. he was. Um, uh, let me see what else. Oh, oh, oh. Here's something that I found fascinating. I had met a man who was Bing Crosby's audio engineer. Hmm. And I was talking with him about what he what he had, uh, his work and I had read that Crosby you know was the first to demand that he be allowed to tape his program yeah that was brand new technology in those days absolutely brand new technology and the reason what was this man's name the engineer Jack something uh, he had been a a uh, uh, Army, I forgot, officer, mm -hmm. forgot what rank it was, in Europe. And his unit had captured uh, in, in the, uh, a German radio operation, I guess. Mm -hmm. He had captured uh, a couple of uh, very early tape recorders. Uh huh. And what he did, he, he had two of them, and he broke one of them down and mailed it home to himself. Hmm. And uh, the other one he turned over to the Army. And uh, he, he was actually doing the, the tape editing in an office next to where CBS was. And he took me up and he showed me how he did it. And I was fascinated by it. Uh, I thought, the, the, this, this is miracle working. Yeah. And uh, I started editing tape for some of the CBS programs. Hmm. And uh, for a, almost a year before the engineers got it written into the contract, their contract, that they would have jurisdiction over it. Tape. I did all the editing for CBS on, out here on the West Coast. Well, my gosh. That kept you busy, I'll bet. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, but, <laughs> and I found it just fascinating. I'll bet. That was the days, of course, razor blade and uh, editing Absolutely. tape. Absolutely. <laughs> a little quarter inch, not quarter inch, what was it, about, yeah. Maybe no quarter inch. A little more than a quarter inch tape. Yeah. Mm, uh, Grease pencil and razor blade. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, man. Exactly what it was. So you, were you still writing at that time, or did you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was doing whatever I could to, you know, to, to learn the business and get ahead of it. Well, good for you. And uh, I remember one day one of the engineers, a guy named Charlie Douglas, gave him the work, and he had a little box with him, and there were some cords coming out of the box and they said what the hell is that Charlie and he said I'll show you and he plugged the uh, one of the outlets into a wall socket and he pushed the button and there was a laugh somebody uh, laughed uh oh <laughs> and uh, he had another button another laugh he had the first laugh machine oh my gosh which I am, you, should, you should have destroyed it right then, because I hear Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I'm with you. I think that's a, one of the worst things that ever happened. I agree. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, that was very interesting. It Was it was it magnetic tape that was producing the, the laughs? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh, my goodness. Um, what, what year did you go to work for CBS at uh, Columbia oh, Square? It was back there in... What did I say, 45 or 46? 45 or 46, okay. You know, there we got an email the other day from a lady who's doing some research on Tokyo Rose. Oh, uh, yeah. There was a, 
a woman announcer who was uh, who was uh, documenting the return of Tokyo Rose from Japan at the end of the war. This must have been in 1947, I I think, and she was trying to identify the the woman's voice. They believed it was somebody from K uh, from KNX. I'm going to. I had never heard that, but as a matter of fact, at the last Friday at the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters Rose for uh, oh R J uh, Robert Wagner. Yes. Uh, there was a guy sitting at our table who had done a book on Tokyo Rose. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Ah, no, was it just to sell? I was just going to blank on yeah. for a moment. Well, I'm, I'm going to email you this recording to see if you can recognize the voice. The lady is desperately looking to see if anybody can identify. Oh, I wasn't. That would have been during the war. That, uh, that no, this, this, was, was, this, at, this, uh, this was later. Yeah, this was later. This was 1947. So you would have been at KNX at that time. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's that's beside the point. We're getting back to your story. Uh, you were writing still promotional copy, or oh other? no 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 no. I had uh, as uh, I became a staff writer director and ah. whatever they threw at me, I had to, had to turn out. Now you were directing what? Radio. I was what? What what were you directing? Oh, again. Uh, all sorts of, we had a little 15-minute fillers and, and, and uh, not fillers, but, you know, 15-minute programs. Yes. I, I wrote for a number of years. Some of, the, uh, some of the people might remember a show that Harry Babbitt, the mm -hmm. singer, did. Sure. On, uh, From it was an early morning, 7.30 or 7.45 a.m., show called The Second Cup of Coffee Club, mm -hmm. and I wrote that for several years. Oh, now Harry Babbitt w was with Kay Kaiser's group, was he not? That's where, yes, that's where he started. Yeah. Correct. And uh, Harry was such a, he was just a wonderfully nice guy. Uh, a little naive, maybe, but uh, <laughs> he was a Really, really a nice man. Good. So, so. <laughs> he, uh, I remember he tell, him telling me once that they were, he was playing a theater in Chicago. And next to the theater was a little uh, bar, uh, dining area where they made hamburgers and stuff. And at that time he had a a record that was a big hit. You could hardly get away from it. It's called the Woody Woodpecker Song. I remember that. <laughs> you you may remember that, and it had a ridiculous laugh that yeah. Harry did. In it. <laughs> 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 I do remember that exactly. And he said that one, one uh, between the breaks and the appearances in the theater, he'd come in the back, of the, uh, the little restaurant there and ordered the hamburger and there was some guy who was sitting at the bar and playing that record over and over and over again. <laughs> and finally the bartender picked up a bottle of beer and he threw it right through the... The, the, uh, the jukebox? What do what they call those? The, the jukebox. Yeah, the jukebox. Yeah right through the jukebox, and he says, I don't want to ever hear that damn number again. <laughs> and Harry said he very quietly put his hamburger down and walked out the back door. Oh. <laughs> I thought maybe you were going to say he, he did the laugh there in person for the no, bartender. No, no, <laughs> no. He, he may have gotten a bottle of beer in his face. <laughs> no, Harry, Harry was not that kind of a guy. Yeah. He was a rather quiet type. Oh, boy. Now, did you work on CBS network programs as well as the local no. KN? No. no, I worked for the local station. Uh -huh. Well, uh, that's, that's not true. I did a number of things that were fed to the network. Mm -hmm. uh, every Saturday for three years, when Hollywood Park and uh, the Santa Anita the tracks were open, yeah. we did... Uh, 
Saturday afternoon we uh, did a broadcast of the feature race. Mm. And I was uh, the director of that uh-huh. uh, that setup. Uh-huh. Uh, this was in radio. Yes. And uh, years later, I, I guess TV took it over and Gil Stratton, uh-huh. former uh, proxy of uh, the <clears throat> broadcasters, yep, yep. Uh, uh, did them. And uh, I learned uh, a lot about horse racing. But oh, I'll bet. Did you ever work with Bob Crane? Uh, Bob Crane... Uh, Bob Crane came in. Bob was a replacement for Ralph Story. Uh-huh. When Ralph was doing a, a morning program at CBS. Mm-hmm. And when he got the offer to go back to do that, uh, oh, what was the quiz show he went back uh, to do? He was hosting yeah. a quiz show out of New York. Out of New York, yes. They had to find a replacement for him. Uh-huh. And uh, Bob Crane was the 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 replacement the, they had looked for I guess months to find just the right guy mm-hmm. and uh, see I'm trying to think of a way to put this that we had a program director who shall be nameless maybe and somebody in uh, New York had talked about this guy that was on the air back there and uh, he was hilarious and the program director went back and signed him as Ralph Story's replacement and uh, he came out here and they said uh, the contract had been signed and they were going to have him do a show and it turns out that he couldn't do it as he had done it back there because what the show back there, he had played the records himself and uh, moved them around and so on and got sounds out of them and stuff. And uh, they said, uh, the union said, you can't do that. We have to have they have to be played by a member of our union. An engineer. Mm-hmm. And uh, they finally solved the problem by hiring an engineer to be present in the studio while Crane did his, uh, did his thing. So he, he, he used, he manipulated the records just as he had back east, but they, yes. but they had a, a union but member standing by. They had to have an engineer yeah, sitting stand. there who... Uh, Did nothing. <laughs> just, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think the uh, program director came on with some pretty harsh uh, words from uh, the upper uh, <clears throat> upper level people. Uh-huh. But, uh, but, did you ever meet Crane? What? Did you ever meet Bob Crane? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. I, as a matter of fact, I am, uh, have a room here at the, the condo that one wall is uh, old LPs. Ah. Uh-huh. And uh, the stuff that Crane couldn't use that, that was the jazz stuff, he would give to me. I have a lot of his... Uh, a lot of the uh, LPs in here. I see. Have two Bob Crane written oh. on them by the record pushers. Oh, I see. Well, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice collection. How did you get interested in jazz? Did you ever play an instrument? No, I never had. Really? But I uh, I don't know. I just uh, was fascinated by it. Oh, for heaven's sake! I love to listen to it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And. Uh, I actually had a rather remarkable knowledge about it for uh, some time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As uh, I, I'm trying to, as a matter of fact, speaking of the jazz, though, uh, George Shearing, the piano player. 
player, the blind piano, English piano player. Yeah. Who was a very, very hot item uh, back in, I guess this would have been the... Uh, the 50s and the early 60s. Yeah, early 60s. Yeah. Uh, they had signed uh, um, George to do a, a program a Sunday afternoon to the network. This did go to the network. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was assigned to put it together, help him, uh, help him work out what he was going to do. And we had something that in those days was was really rather uh, advanced for that uh, that type of radio. Mm -hmm. uh, we would uh, we recorded it at George's house in his music room uh, in Hollywood. We would select the number the records that he was going to use, and he would. He would just kind of ad lib, obviously. You, mm -hmm. you don't have a, a script with a blind man. No. And uh, he would he would just kind of set the, uh, sit at the piano and riffle, the, you know, a little musical background as he chatted mm -hmm. about the uh, numbers, and then he would play recordings. Uh -huh. But we. Uh, did it in such a way, uh, worked out in advance, of course, that when the record started, George's riffling would be in tempo and in key with the number that was coming up. Oh. So it just so seemed to go right into the... Into the music. Right into the uh, recording. Yeah, music. yeah. He and I became great friends, and for... Mm -hmm. About ten years, he was probably my closest friend here. I met him just one time, but I was very impressed. He was such a gentleman. Yes, yes, he and he had a great sense of humor. Oh yes, he surely did. Uh, we we usually tape those shows, and I think they were, as I recall, they were ninety minute programs. Uh, maybe it was an hour. I don't remember. It's so long ago. Uh, and and. One time, for some reason, we were doing uh, the program live in the studio at CBS, at KNX, at Columbia Square. And uh, he was doing the, the business at the piano, and he was just kind of ad-libbing this and that, and he was leading into a, a Chrysler commercial. Mm-hmm. And he said, Chrysler is really a wonderful car. He said, I love the Chrysler. It's the only car I ever drive. We go into the commercial. And I said, George, people know you're blind. What do you mean? It's the only car you ever drive. He said, Don't worry, I'll fix it. And when we came out of the commercial, he said, somebody asked me while I was playing, how I, knowing I was blind, how I could say it that I drive a Chrysler. He said, it's very simple. I have a white steering wheel. <laughs> we there in. Oh, man. I do remember the, the one time I met him uh, and I said hello and he said, it's nice to see you, Jerry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's typical of it. Oh, well, I won't take the time now, but yeah. uh, there are so many stories I can tell oh, you. Oh, this is wonderful. Uh, we, as I say, became very close uh, when I met him, the only card, the, the, the most sophisticated card game he had ever played was gin rummy. Mm -hmm. And I taught him how to play hearts. Uh -huh. And he loved it because he had that kind of a retentive mind mm -hmm. and he could remember the cards. For heaven's sake. And he liked hearts so much that he got the Braille Book of Hoyle and studied bridge. Oh my goodness! And for a number of years, we'd play bridge two or three times a week. Wow! Huh. And uh, Trixie, uh, his wife, uh, didn't have the card sense that George had. Mm -hmm. And she would every time we'd sit down to play, she'd have to say, "How does this game go again?" <laughs> 
patients right there at hand. Uh-huh. And it irritated George. <laughs> I'll bet. And when he and Trixie finally split up, uh, my contention is that he had found a, another woman oh. who loved to play bridge. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, but she... And I always felt kind of guilty about having taught him uh, hearts in the first place. Wow, so you may have been a an unsuspecting uh, collaborator there in that yeah. breakup. Who knows? There, there's something I would like to tell you about. Sure. This goes back to, I think, probably 1952 and I was I'd gone up to uh, back up to uh, Tacoma for a high school reunion or something and I went on up into uh, Canada and to Vancouver <clears throat> and I was driving back to Tacoma one Sunday evening and there was a program on a Canadian radio station, and it was a priest. And you would hear the priest, he would be on the telephone, and the priest would say, ah, yes, 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 I understand, yes, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And he'd hang up the phone and he'd say, that was a young lady who called to ask about such and such and such. And he would tell what she had said and his response. And I thought that uh, that's fascinating, but uh, it's so incomplete. And when I got back to down here to Los Angeles, got back to work, I went to Ted Denton, who was our chief engineer, and I told him about the experience, and I said, Ted, why couldn't we hear the young woman, too? And he thought for a moment, he said, well, you could. We could do that. And several months later, I was doing a show with a guy named Gil Henry that was supposed to originate at a different location every day. And Gil was a, a very good at interviews. But he was not good at timing. And we would go out and record this from some some location, I, whatever it was. And we didn't tell them in advance where it was going to be because we didn't know ourselves. And uh, one day, uh, I'd have to I'd have to take the uh, the interview that Gil had done and take it back to the studio and edit it the time so it would fit in our allotted 15 minutes or mm. 14, 30 in those days. Yeah. And uh, one day I, I knew by the end of the week I didn't have anything set and that I was working long hours by this time, 10, 12 hours a day. And uh, so I went to Ted the engineer, and I said, Ted, do you remember that thing I told you about? And I related it to him, and he said, yeah, yeah, and I said, I've got a, a program coming up on Friday, and I don't have a location to go to. Could we try that? And he said, yeah, I can set that up for you. And so we went on the air on that Friday, and Gil said, uh, I, I wrote a little intro and he said something to the effect that uh, today we're going to try something absolutely new in radio. He said, you, the audience, are going to be the program. And Tom Harmon, the sports hero from uh, what was it, Minnesota, wasn't he? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, he, he had the office next to mine at the station, and he'd been doing a thing about whether or not college athletes should be subsidized. Mm -hmm. And so I had Gil say, Tom's been talking about this, and we would like to know how you, the audience, feels about this. And now I had been, been in the business long enough 
enough to know that there's nothing, nothing worse than dead air. Right. So I went around to various people at the studio, secretaries and, uh, and uh, you know, just people who were working there in one form or another, uh, uh, engineers, whatever. And I said, here's what we're doing on this program, and I, I don't want there to be any dead air. So here's the number, and I said, I want you to call, and uh, I'm telling you in advance so you'll have a chance to form some ideas about this. And when we get on the air, Gil does the opening, and he says, now we're going to pause for a commercial, and right after that we'll begin to take your phone call. And we go into the commercial, and the phone began to ring. Jerry, not one of the people that I had set up was able to get through. Oh my gosh, you had that many calls. Just immediately. Wow. Immediately, the whole concept of people being part of the program caught on. Now, and now I don't very often mention, that was in... Uh, that was in 1953 or 54. Wow. That, now, that w was one of the first call-in shows that... It was the first uh, that I was aware of. Yeah. But uh, Did you... ABC... Well, here's what happened. Uh, in 1959, we started doing that, using that concept as a regular nighttime feature on a program called Opinion Please. Mm -hmm. And Mel Baldwin uh -huh. was the uh, was the host. Oh yes, you remember Mel? I'm oh, sure. very well. Music uh, to music till dawn. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Well, that that's it was a nighttime show, and he was on I think from nine to ten or something. Uh -huh. But you know what happened? We started selling nighttime radio. We hadn't been able to sell in years. Mm. Because people weren't, weren't listening mm. to radio, they were going to television. Sure, but Opinion Please brought them in. That brought them in. Wow. And it was a, almost a year later that ABC Radio here uh, mm. decided to use the contact. I mean, I mean the concept the program. Yeah, yeah. At, the at, idea. At what point did, did they require you to... Uh, Record the conversations with a yes. beep with a beeper. So yes, we had a we had it set up so that the uh, the tape was delayed. I think it was seven seconds. Yes, before it got on the air. And there had to be. And a I frankly, I I oppose that because <laughs> I thought if the people take the you know if they get the idea that they may hear something. Yeah. that they shouldn't be shouldn't be on the air. Yeah, they'll, listen. they'll listen. More yeah, that'll be that would be a selling point. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was right. Now Anyhow, in, but no, but, I, but in the early days the I think it was the FCC required there to be a, an audible beep so that the people would know that they're being recorded. Yeah. 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 They don't do that anymore. I, I don't think for the purposes of at this point that we had to have that, but it was true later. Later on. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very uh, interesting. So, I'm the guy that started talk radio, well, to the best of my knowledge. That's that's a, a big feather in your hat there, uh, Jim. Well, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not altogether proud of that <laughs> today no. because of the fact that I think so many opinionated Arrogant types have taken over uh, that business. Yeah, that's for sure. It didn't take long. No. It didn't take long. No. So, well, you, you went on from CBS, K, KNX, at some point, I, under, I know. Where did you go? Um, I'll, I'll, let me tell you how that happened. Or did, let me I ask had, you. Uh, had some problems in my own personal life. I was going through a divorce. Uh oh. And uh, I decided that I had gone as far as I could go. Uh, and at that point, uh, the reason 
I'm pausing here is because uh, I I met a, a man that was all had always been one of my idols. Is uh, Lowell Thomas. Oh boy! Uh, and I said, Mr. Thomas, I've been here at CBS for so long. I can remember well back when you were doing your regular 15-minute nightly broadcast. I said, I've always thought I would love to work for you. And he said, really? I said, yeah. And he said, well, he said, I've got that little network back in uh, upstate New England. Uh, he said, here's the name of the guy that runs that for me. Write, write him and tell him about yourself. And I was very excited. And then I got to thinking, wait a minute. Those people in the, that little network up in New England are wishing they could get the get to Hollywood. I'm already here. Why would I want to go back there? Yeah. So I never followed up on that. For heaven's sake. He, uh, he was a wonderful guy, wasn't he? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, well, there's some more stories I, I can tell you, but I <clears throat> I was I I only met him at one time also in Spokane and when I was in high school I belonged to a Toastmasters a junior Toastmasters group and we used to meet downtown once a week and do our little uh, you know speeches and whatnot and Lowell Thomas was bringing his radio broadcast to town that one night and we decided to go over to the CBS affiliate station to see if we could get in to watch him do his his newscast. And we, we, I think there were about five or six of us. We went up there and snuck into the audience studio, and we, we very quietly went to the back of the room so as not to disturb anybody. And he, Lowell Thomas and his wife and producer walked in and were up on the stage uh, sitting around a, a table with the microphone in the center getting ready for the broadcast. And about two minutes before, he looked out and saw us, and he said, Boys, what are you doing back there? And we very timidly said, we wondered if we could watch you do your broadcast. He said, you can't see anything back there. Come on up here on the stage and sit, <laughs> sit with us. Come on up here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the, the, those were the great glory days of the business. Oh, boy. You better believe it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you were aware of this, but he, his writer, uh, who wrote for him for years, they were very close friends, and there the writer would occasionally throw in a line to throw him because he knew that if he could get Lowell Thomas to start laughing, oh yeah, <laughs> he could never he would have a terrible time recovering. That's right, and there's some wonderful and bloopers. <laughs> I remember this was oh, what would the year have been? Dwight D. Eisenhower was the uh, oh the uh, the president to be. He was, uh -huh. he had not been sworn in as yet. And uh, that night, the, uh, this was again back in the days when they did the two, uh, two broadcasts, East and West Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he wrote some copies that said something to the effect that today Dwight D. Eisenhower, president-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower went to the famous old Her uh, chocolate town of Hershey, Pennsylvania, and he said, and all of the workers, with and without nuts, turned out to <laughs> see the president. <laughs> uh, and Thomas read the line, and he evidently hadn't re read it uh, ahead of time. Yeah. Because he started to snicker <laughs> at that with it without nuts. Yeah. And he 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 just blew it. He <laughs> couldn't finish his program. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah, he was he was noted for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you you did not go with him to the uh, northeast. No, no, no. I thought, well, you know, I'm I'm already here. You're Those here. guys back there are trying to get here. Sure, sure. But you wanted to move on to some place. Yeah, and they called me in one day, and I'd been doing a show with another one of our PPPers, Ruth Ashton, uh -huh. uh, before she'd uh, gone over to television, and, and before she became Ruth Ashton Taylor. And uh, they called me into the office.
office. And as I say, I was getting, uh, going through the divorce, I was having a, some personal problems. And they told me the program director, the general manager, I don't remember now which one it was, told me that they were going to move my office from one floor to another. And I heard myself say, well, when you do that, I'm going to keep moving. I'm leaving. Mm. And it turned out, oh, it was the, uh, it, it was the, pro the program director. Because CBS was having some problems at that time, financial problems. And they were cutting back. And this would have been uh, probably about 56. No, oh, no, excuse me, 66. Probably about 66. And uh, I walked out of the office and I thought, what in the hell did I do? I quit. I didn't mean to quit. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that the guy who was told me they were going to move the office wound up doing a lot of the work that I'd been doing. And uh, But that turned out to be a real benefit for me. It, it was one of the best things that could have happened because, among other things, as I said, as a staff writer, you did whatever you were assigned to do. And Ralph's story was doing a little five-minute insert called Ralph's Story in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and I was the director of it. And I did several of those. I did uh, a, a, a little five-minute uh, strip with Pat Boone, another one with uh, Edith Head, the fashion designer. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ralph Story's regular writer went on vacation, and I was assigned to uh, to do the writing for a, a couple of weeks while he was away. And among the, I had I had met a guy named Tom Drake. Now people may not remember that name, but they will remember the character. He was the boy next door in Meet Me in St. Louis. And his career after that picture had kind of gone blue. Yeah, I remember. All of the part. Yeah. And uh, I had met him, and I was impressed with the fact that he was trying to make a comeback. And so I wrote a piece about him for Ralph. And uh, it evidently paid off for him because he called me and uh, invited me to come out to MGM and have lunch with him. And I went out and because I'd, I'd left CBS and was looking around for something to do. And I went out and had lunch with him. And after the lunch, he said, walk over to the casting office with me. He said, I, I want to thank him for the part that he said, you help me, help me get it. And he went, went in and thanked him for the job. And he came out and he said, now walk upstairs with me. And we walk upstairs. And there's a big office uh, ante room with several desks and two secretaries there. And they, he'd been under contract there for so long that they, they knew Tom. And he said to the girls, he said, is Howard in? And they said, no, he's off the lot. And he said, oh, and he joked with him and carried on. And as we were leaving, he said, he turned to the girls and he said, tell Howard that Gene Webster came by to see him, will you? And they laughed and I laughed. I thought he was making a joke. <laughs> and uh, about a week later, he called me and he said, did you call Howard Strickling? And I said, who the hell's Howard Strickling? And he said, well, you were there in his office. And I said, I 
thought you were kidding. What was I supposed to call him about? And he said, you want to go to work? And I said, well, yeah, I guess. I'm not doing anything. So I went out and, and met Howard Strickling, who was uh, one of the big names in the business. Yeah, what, what lot was this? At MGM. MGM. At MGM. Mm-hmm. And uh, Howard was uh, had been there for years, and he was probably he was head of advertising and publicity, and is mm. probably best known for the fact that he kept stories out of the papers instead of getting them into the papers. Ah, he's a screener. Stories about the, some of their stars. Sure. Uh huh. And uh, I went out and met with him and. He seemed like a nice guy, and we had a nice chat. And uh, after about half an hour, he suddenly said, "Well, can you start Monday?" And I said, "Yeah, I guess so." And he said, "Be here at 9 a.m. on Monday." And he did not have people who work for him punch a time clock, but he had a meeting every day at nine o'clock, and you'd better be there. And uh, that was about the time that um, they were just finishing up the post-production work on Dr. Zhivago. Uh, and I was assigned to try to help out with that. And the very first day I was there, Howard had said, I want you to be in such and such an office at 11 o'clock this morning. And I said, yes, sir. And I show up in the office, and there are some mock-ups of ads mounted around the room at this office. And there are a number of people milling around. And Strickling said to me, Gene, which one do you like? And I thought, geez, I don't know who these people are. I don't know whose toes I'm going to be stepping on. <laughs> And I thought, well, maybe I should just try to be honest. And I said, well, I think I like this one. And he said, why? And I gave him the, some kind of reasoning. And it just happened to be the one that they wound up using. Oh. Uh, it had nothing to do with me other than the fact that I made a lucky guess, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I... Uh, I was there for, uh, oh, I guess probably a year and a half. And uh, MGM was going through uh, some changes at that, time, uh, at that time also. They had told their stockholders that Zhivago had cost $17 million, which in, the, in those days, in the mid-60s, was unheard of for a motion picture. Mm-hmm. And I knew from what I had learned that it cost at least 22 mil. <laughs> and they had uh, they lied to the stockholders by mm. a few thousand dollars. By a few, uh, few million dollars. A few million dollars. And uh, a guy named Kerkorian found out about this. Mm -hmm. And he used that knowledge to win the stockholders over, and he took over the company. Yeah. He managed to take over the company. Mm-hmm. Kirk Kirk And uh, an interesting thing happened as a result of that. MG, MGM was trying to get their long-established stars to come out and talk about what a great picture Dr. Zhivago was. And I was assigned to go out and get a taping with, among other people, Greer Garson. And uh, I took my little tape recorder and I went out to her house mm. and I met Miss Garson. She was very, very charming. Really? And we cut this little tape that she was to, to do. And uh, I'm 
leaving, and I glanced up a stairwell, and I saw a, a painting up there. And I said, oh, I see you have a Ludwig Benelitz painting. And she said, yes. Do you know him? And I said, well, I'm a big fan of his because I'd, I'd read of his books, and he had, he had a guy that had come to this country as a, a waiter in a hotel in New York. And he went on to become a well-known writer. And Miss Carson said, well, he's a, he's a very close friend of ours. And we, uh, she was at that time married to the big Texas multi-millionaire in the oil business. And uh, I suspect that she was cut off from a lot of, a lot of things a lot of people, a lot of friends. But she was fascinated with the fact that I knew knew Bemelman's work and so on. Mm -hmm. And we became we became momentarily momentary friends and she used to call me on occasion just to chat. Mm. And uh, I have had such a lucky life, Jerry. Oh, it sounds like it. I'm surprised. That, that kind of surprises me because all the stories I've ever heard about Greer Garson was that she was kind of difficult to work with and insisted upon being called Miss Garson. Well, that that may well be the case, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I just happened to... You got on the right side of her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I yeah. found that that also was true with uh, Edith Head, who yeah. was known to be difficult. Oh, yes, with. yeah, very, very snippy. And to go back when I was starting out at CBS, do you know the name Lud Gluskin? Oh, yeah, Lud Gluskin's orchestra. Yeah, well, Lud was head of the music department at CBS Radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just starting out, and I was young and brash, and I, uh, the director on a a kids program called It's Fun to Be Young was a man named Sterling Tracy. And he used to let me sit, they, they would have kids who would come on as musicians or singers or whatever and display their talents. And we would hold auditions. And Trace, Tracy let me sit in on it. And with the, we were set to do an audition one afternoon and the, the mothers are there with their wannabe stars. And Dick Arant, who was the musician who was supposed to uh, accompany them as they performed, was late getting, getting to the studio. And Tracy came into the control room where I was sitting, and he said, Call the music department and tell Dick Arant to get his ass down here. So I dialed the number, and this man answers. And I said, will you tell Dick Arant to get his ass down here? And the voice says, do you know who this is? And I said, no. And he said, this is blood. Gluskin. Now, Gluskin was known to be a martinet and difficult. Uh, he demanded mm -hmm. attention and subservience. Mm -hmm. And when he said, this is Lord Gluskin, I said, well, do you know who this is? And he said, no. And I said, nothing. And I hung the phone up. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> But you did, you you pulled a good a good move there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think so too. I, uh, Gene, I'm curious. You went out to interview uh, Greer Garson with a portable tape machine. What brand was that? You recall? Oh God, I don't remember. It was something that they inaugural. Uh, they handed me and said, "Go do this interview with her." I was just curious what what portable units they were using in those days. Oh uh, God, I don't. I really don't recall. This would have been. A, uh, in the mid-60s. Yeah, probably a Nogra, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. 
So there, you stayed with uh, MGM then for, what did you say, two and a half years? Uh, no, about a, uh, about a year and a half. year and a half. And they were cutting back because of the fact that the uh, and had taken over the company. And oh, yeah. Making mm-hmm. a big thing about spending. And I was, I guess, the last uh, one to be added in that department. So you were the first and to And I had moved up to, I was doing the publicity on... Uh, the Man from Uncle, ah. which was a very hot property. Sure, well, sure. And uh, so, where did you go from there? Well, I from there, I I was a member of the Publicist Guild at that time. Uh, I went on to do some uh, publicity in other other studios. Uh, I was at. Paramount. Uh, I did the publicity on a picture called The Sterile Cuckoo, which was Liza Minnelli's first picture in this country. She'd done one other picture in uh, England. This was her first picture in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did a publicity on a picture called With Six You Get Egg Roll, which was for CBS Films. that we was shot right out here in the valley. Oh, there was a young guy who played a car hop in that picture, a car hop on a roller skate. And he was very trim and uh, rather uh, almost business-like appearing. His name was George Carlin. Oh, my gosh. Before Carlin had become a name. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, let me see. Oh, I had uh, I had done the picture of that uh, the Cyril Cuckoo, and what we shot in Rome, New York, at Hamilton College back there. And uh, while I was there, I got a call from a friend who was with ABC Television. And he, was, he had been the editorial director, and he was being promoted to news director. His name was Virgil Mitchell. And he said, how would you like to come over here and be the editorial director? And I said, Virgil, oh, I said, what I said was, I'd like to talk about it, because when you're, when you're freelancing, you never say, no, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. No. That was kind of the way I felt. And I was supposed to do another picture that was to shoot in Chicago in January with, uh, oh, God, the guy who played Zorba the Greek. Oh, I know what you mean. Uh, yes. Oh. Yeah, Don't, I can't, uh, I'm going blank on the name. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, the Sterile Cuckoo was Alan Pakula's first picture as a director. He'd been a producer before that. And as a result, he ran over schedule for about uh, two weeks. And uh, I missed the, sh- the picture <laughs> in uh, uh, Chicago in January. And uh, I took the job at ABC as the editorial director, thinking I would just be there for a, until another picture came along. But when the other picture came along, it was at a, something called Big Foss and Little Halsey, and I read the screenplay and was not at all impressed by it. And uh, I had told ABC I was going to be moving on and they offered me a more money, a better deal, so I stayed. And what was to have been maybe a couple months job became 18 years. I stayed there for 18 mm-hmm. years as the editorial director, and that's where things really began to happen for me. Mm-hmm. I uh, was the one of the co-founders of a, called NBEA, the National Broadcast Editorial.
Royalists Association, and I was on the board of that for a while. Uh, I uh, found I had had an ability, and uh, to to find items and turn them into something. Uh, I had a a criteria that I set for myself that you never complain about an issue or a situation unless you make a suggestion as to how to improve it. <clears throat> and it began to pay off for me. And while I was editorial director there at ABC, I won. Let me see. Four golden mics, uh, awards from the press club. Uh, four golden mics, as you know, are from the Radio and TV News Association. Mm -hmm. uh, the Valley Press Club, I won several awards from uh, Greater Los Angeles Press Agents, uh, uh, Greater Los Angeles Press Club. Uh, I won. I think three or four awards from them, and uh, I later became the president of the uh, press club in uh, about 1987. Uh, I this morning I was I've got a room where I do some of my work today, I, I do a, a little uh, email which I send out to some friends and a few subscribers, uh, which I call Random Meanderings. Incidentally, I sent you a copy of the last one. Oh, good. Very, because uh, I had a, this last year, I had a daughter who died. Oh. Uh, as a result of the fall, and she'd hit her head mm. and developed a brain clot, a blood clot on the brain. Oh, dear. And uh, I was, it, it kind of set me back. Oh, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, but I, I sent you a, a little story about uh, uh, being, uh, the night I was sworn in as president of the press club, and Mm. A daughter was my date for the. Uh, oh, good. For the event. Uh huh. <clears throat> uh, I've got a number of awards there from the California Teachers Association. Uh, I've got a notice of, of uh, my membership in the Sigma Delta Chi. It's a Uh -huh. I've got awards from the city and the county, the state, and services and for service and community betterment. The state bar has given me a, an award for distinguished distinguished reporting on the administration of justice. Mm -hmm. I was uh, on the board of a thing called UIDA, the Urban Indian. very many people are aware of the fact that Los Angeles has the largest concentration of American Indians of any area in the United States. No, I did not know that. Well, it's because they are, they all come from different tribes. Mm -hmm. So they do not congregate in a neighborhood. <clears throat> I see. They're, all, they're all dispersed throughout the area. Hmm. California peace officers uh, gave me a, well, the California peace officers, Los Angeles deputy sheriffs, victims, mm -hmm. uh, victims of violent crimes foundation gave me a citation for work I had done in that area. And uh, I have a, an award that I'm rather proud of from the uh, National Council 
central on alcoholism and drug dependency. Uh, because of the work in, in the editorial area, I was appointed to the L.A. County Commission on Alcoholism. Oh. By Baxter Ward. Now, that uh -huh. goes back over 30 years. Well, I would think so, yes. Uh, they don't they don't know exactly when I came aboard because mm -hmm. of the fact that they'd had a fire in one of the county buildings and destroyed all that early evidence, but uh, they knew it was at least 30 years ago. For heaven's sake. I do remember you gave me a business card with that information on it. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that ties in with the work that I was doing as the editorial director because uh, I had realized that in talking to people in the field mm. that if a doctor got mm. as much as two hours of training and recognition of uh, symptoms involving al uh, alcoholism or drug dependency, incidentally, the one the one thing one of the things that I find so frustrating, Jerry is that uh, most the, 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 the big concentration is on the danger of illegal drugs. Mm -hmm. And while they are dangerous, there's only one drug that kills more people. That's than alcohol. Alcohol, yep. That's, no, no. It's nicotine. Oh, yes, now I forget about that. Yeah, people mm -hmm. do. Yeah, yeah. And there is a t tendency <clears throat> on the part of people in the business to refer to alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. that, that drives me up the wall because I'm absolutely convinced that that's promoted by the alcohol industry. Oh, man. Yeah. Because when they say alcohol and drugs, it makes them sound as if makes it sound as if alcohol is not a drug. Yes, yes. And, uh, I had done some research a few years ago for a piece I was writing. And at that time, the total number of the people in the U.S. killed by all illegal drugs combined was less than 2% of the people mm -hmm. who uh, were killed by uh, alcohol alcohol-related accidents. Wow. Huh. And uh, armed with that information, I had a chance to talk to Herschel Rosenthal, who was the state senator, and he represented an area uh, out at the edge of West Los Angeles and Santa Monica. <clears throat> and I pointed out to him that there were a lot of senior citizens in that area. And the number one drug with seniors is alcohol. Mm, yeah, I'm sure. W working back in the early days of radio, as you were uh, at the network level even, I'm sure that most people in those days smoked cigarettes. Oh, and, I was a heavy cigarette smoker. And, and I suspect that there, from what I've heard, a lot of uh, those radio people were also dependent on alcohol. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, you've heard, you know that. I, I was absolutely shocked. That's when, very true. I was absolutely shocked when I heard that for the first time that between the East Coast feed and the West Coast performances, many of them would spend time in the local bar consuming alcohol. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, there was one very popular star who uh, had his own program and they would it was on on Saturdays they would come in and rehearse the program and then go on a dinner break while they let the audience in for the uh, <laughs> for the broadcast and often the star of the program would get so stoned, get so drunk mm -hmm. that they couldn't do, do the program. Oh my gosh. And, uh, well, I think that had probably had something to do with the program 
going off the air. And his name was? No, I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> he is a well-known name, but there's no yeah. need to yeah. get into that. Well, I think I know the name, but I won't mention it either. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wanted to finish up a that yeah. talking with uh, Hirsch Rosenthal. Mm-hmm. And I, I talked to him about the number of seniors that were in his area and the, the doctors uh, don't get any training in dealing with it. And that's why the medical profession for many, many years, generations, had been singularly unsuccessful in treating alcoholics mm-hmm. because they didn't know about the, the symptoms. And I pointed out to him <clears throat> that uh, it's the lack of training, the fact that they get less than two hours of training yeah. in all of their eight years of study. And he said, what do you think should be done about it? And I said, they need to teach the uh, medical profession about the real elements of alcoholism. Mm-hmm. And I talked him into carrying a bill. That bill became effective. It, it passed the legislature. It came, became effective in 1987. Oh, four. And now must be able to show evidence of training and recognition of the symptoms mm-hmm. of alcohol and other drug abuse. You notice I say other drug abuse. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, in order to become licensed in California. Well, now, mm-hmm. I don't think that element of it has ever been really enforced. Mm-hmm. No. But as a result of that, a number of colleges and universities in California now carry courses in mm-hmm. recognition of alcohol and drug abuse symptoms. Gary, I think that pretty well covers it, don't you think? You've done a wonderful job uh, re- relating your, uh, your history. Uh, I assume you remarried after your divorce. Yes, I did remarry a second time, uh-huh. and that didn't last either. Uh oh. Uh, no, and now uh, Kathy and I have been together for sixteen years, and it's a marvelous relationship. Oh, that's wonderful. One of the best I've ever had. You, uh, you met her. Yes, at the last luncheon. Yes, and you you mentioned the daughter who's unfortunately not with you any longer. Did you have other children? Oh yes, I had uh, two boys and uh, and Joe, the girl who died. Uh-huh. She was in the middle. Okay. Uh, my my oldest son is is today the fifth. Yes. His birthday was yesterday. Oh. February fourth. He was he was the. Uh, Mm-hmm. My youngest son, I believe, is uh, yeah, it was fifty. He'll be fifty-one in June. Are they in the Are they in the LA area as well? Yes. And doing what? Well, no, no. The the youngest son is the uh, the older the older son is up in San Pablo. Ah. Uh, East Bay. And your brother? Uh, My brother passed away uh, a number of years ago. Okay. Father, uh, we've been, I guess we're a fairly hearty group. My father uh, died at 88. Mm. And uh, last December 27th, I turned uh, 84. For heaven's sake, you do very well. Well, I'm, I'm beginning to feel the encroachment of the years. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> I think it happens to all of us. It's, but it's nice to be, still be around anyway, isn't it, Gene? Yeah. 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 Well, I've enjoyed talking with you, and I'm, I'm sure that people who listen to this recording uh, 50 years from now will be uh, absolutely enthralled by your audio history. Uh, we've enjoyed it very much, and I wanted to thank you for taking time to do it with us. Well, I thank you. I thank you for your interest. Your concern, your and uh, I, I have had a wonderful life. And the hills and valleys. There's been a lot of both. Oh, indeed. And uh, it's been a, it's been.
was a good experience, and I consider myself a very lucky and blessed individual. As well you should. We've been speaking with uh, Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters charter member Gene Webster. He's speaking to us on the telephone from his home in Studio City, California. Uh, we thank him for being with us. And we thank you for listening. This is Jerry Fry. I'm the audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. And again, thanks for listening.